Well, good morning. I'm Rick Spiker. I'll be doing uh, the Friday night uh, Bible study for the next uh, month in January, and then we're going to be tag teaming. Uh, we'll have a, a different teacher every month, and we'll rotate between Dwayne, myself, and Ron Heath. And we're going to, I'm just going to pick up where Ron left off. We're going to go into Acts chapter 2 today. And I think there isn't really a part of the Bible that isn't just thrilling and interesting when you get into it. But this one's on the surface just really exciting. This one doesn't take a lot of digging to, 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 um, to be excited about it. This is the birth of the church. And we are living in that age. So um, this, this really is about us and about God's plan for us, the church. So um, with that, let's go to the Lord in prayer and let's dig in. Dear Lord, thank you for being here this morning with us. Thank you for your, your word. Thank you for your love for us, Lord. Um, Lord, thank you that you designed this church, this body of believers, um, centered in our love and um, surrender to Jesus Christ, who you sent to save us from our sins. And, and you've created a glorious future for us, Lord. And uh, we get to live part of that here on this earth and then for all eternity, which we have really no concept of what that'll be like. But we know that you are good and it, it'll be more awesome than we can even imagine or think. So, Lord, with that, we ask you to be with us and guide us and direct us today as we look into uh, the birth of the church. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'll read the scriptures. We'll, we'll go through verse 1 through 13 of chapter 2 of Acts. And I'll read the scripture this morning, and then we'll dig in. And when the day, I'm in the, let me get to the English standard. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound of the multitude, and at this sound, the multitude came together. And they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in their own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Pontus in Asia, uh, I can't, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya, belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Ar Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocking said, they are filled with new wine. All right, that's, that's our scripture for today. It's exciting. So, we're going to start off with the very first part of verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived. So this was the feast. This is the fourth feast of the seven feasts. This is the last feast of the spring. It marked the, the, um, the grain harvest. So it's... It's 50 days after um, Passover, which was in the spring. 
And in Jerusalem, the harvest for grains, this would be the wheat and barley harvests and rye and, and the grains are the first crops to come off. And um, this was when they would present, um, well, this was the first fruits. And so um, this feast was a, a feast of bread or it was a sacrifice of bread. It was a feast of, they call it feast of weeks and feast of first fruits and Pentecost. That's all the same, um, the same feast. What's interesting about Pentecost is that if you, th if you look at the, at the design, you've got your uh, 50 days, and how do you come up with 50 days? It's seven times seven, so seven weeks of seven gives us 49, and the next day is the feast day, and that's the Jubilee. So Pentecost is the Jubilee day after um, Easter. Very interesting, too, that the, 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 um, the feasts, the Old um, Testament feasts, starting with um, Passover, then uh, unleavened bread, and then first fruits, and then the feast of, uh, excuse me, um, it's not first fruits, it's, um, yeah, it is, it's when Jesus um, rose from the dead, and then this, this feast were all fulfilled with New Testaments, um, with Jesus' um, death, his burial, and his resurrection, and now the birth of the church on Pentecost. All of these activities that affect the church and the, and the um, um, uh, Jesus' first coming are fulfilled in these four feast days. And so this is the final feast day of the spring, and this was the day when Jesus had told them to hang out in Jerusalem, don't be going anywhere, um, and they were still afraid, so they locked the doors, and um, they were uh, obeying the Lord. And on this particular day, uh, God moved. God designed it. He planned it. He told Jesus to prepare them. Gave, Jesus gave them instruction. This is not by happenstance. This was not by man. The, the birth of the church was not man-made. Um, it's not fables. It's not um, a design of man. It's a design of God. And we'll see that very clearly, um, that these were things well beyond man's imagination. And even today... Um, we need to understand that we are uh, following the lead of Christ. We're not leading, we're following the lead, and God gives us the comforter, the Holy Spirit, to guide and direct us, and that's really his design for us is to lean into that, lean into our faith, and lean into what he's provided for us. So um, I mentioned to you that Jesus had instructed in John uh, 20, verse 19 through 22, Jesus said, and he breathed on them. And the word breathe is the same word. Uh, it's the Greek equivalent to the Hebrew word that's used in Genesis when God created man. He breathed. It's like a puff. He breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. And yes, okay. And then in Acts um, 1, 4, and 5, we just read it last week. Wait for the promise of the Father. He said, you heard from me, from John the Baptist. You heard from me, for John the Baptist baptized with water but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So we understand on Pentecost, God instructed the, the um, disciples to hang out in, the, in that upper room, and that's where they were. And suddenly there came from heaven 
the sound of a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Now, this wind was not just your basic wind. It was so loud that it disturbed multitudes. You've got the Feast of Pentecost going on, and you've got hundreds and thousands of people milling around Jerusalem. And in this house, you have this activity of God. It's, you've got the wind going on, and it penetrated well past the house, and everybody heard it. It was like a, I don't want to say a bomb, but it was like a small tornado. It was an incredible sound to think about if you had the wind and they heard it across the street and down. I mean, you're talking about a pretty, a pretty loud event. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were setting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation and every heaven, and, and on the sound of the multitude um, they came together. Let's, um, let's unpack this um, event. First off, the disciples were waiting on God to act. Very important. Christianity is not the story of excuse me Christianity is the story of a loving God reaching out to save um, an ultimate and ultimately adopt undeserving mankind it's not mankind uh, reaching out to impress uh, God so um, the idea that that um, they were hanging out and being patient is is very interesting. They had no idea what God was going to do. They, they didn't know anything. They knew that they were going to wait for the comforter. Um, they didn't have any idea. They weren't given much instruction. God um, gives us just enough to follow. Haven't we found that in our lives, that uh, he doesn't lay out the whole plan in front of us? He gives us instructions to do, and he says, go here, go there, um, and I'll... I'll I'll, um, I'll make a way for you. Sometimes we hear that, but um, it's always a matter of us um, waiting on the Lord. The sound was loud. I mentioned that. The Holy Spirit manifested himself as wind and fire. So I want you to think back in terms of the wind. Remember when, when Christ told Nicodemus, you must be born again. The wind blows about, it, it wishes, and you hear it, its sound, so it will be who, whoever is born of the, of the Spirit. And so the wind is um, a personification of the Holy Spirit that entered mightily and powerfully. Um, the cloves of fire um, is also interesting and also scripturally uh, has scriptural precedent. Uh, we know that when Moses met with God in the wilderness, uh, he was confronted with the burning bush, which is cloves of fire sitting on the bush, and it wasn't consuming the bush. Uh, it didn't burn these guys' hair. Um, it was the fire was on top of them, resting on them, and um, they were. Um, that's the manifestation of the Holy Spirit that had come upon them that day. I think it's also interesting, too, of the idea that they spoke with the clothes of fire. It brings me back to Isaiah, when Isaiah um, saw the Lord. He declared he was a man of unclean lips, living with people with unclean lips. And God set an angel um, to get a coal and put it on Isaiah's lips. And when he did, that coal of fire, uh, the angel declared, Thine iniquity is taken away, thy sin is purged. God takes unclean vessels and saves us. Uh, we come to, to God in lowliness. We usually receive the Lord when we're at the end of our life, when our life is, um, when we've kind of figured out that we can't, 
we can't be the person we want to be. Um, we've made a mess of our life. We come in humility to the Lord. And we, we bring a lot of stuff with us. We are not cleaned up when we come to the Lord. A lot of people think they have to get cleaned up, but that's not God's plan. God says, you come to me, and then I will deal with you. And one of the things he does is he gives us the Holy Spirit. Sanctification is a part of that process, but the Holy Spirit comes in power and in might. And um, when a person is filled with the Holy Spirit, there's an immediate change. Uh, we'll see that in Paul and Peter next week, but we see that in lives of people, um, in a real sense, when we speak of the power of the dwelling of the Holy Spirit, we speak beyond ourselves. Um, this, and, and in this case, it was of supernatural speaking beyond themselves. They spoke in another language. Uh, they didn't know what they were saying, but everybody from that region understood them. And in many ways, when we allow the Holy Spirit to work in us, we speak in our own languages, but we'll speak prophecy. We'll speak um, discernment. Um, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are manifest in our speaking sometimes in our doing, but a lot of in our speaking, our communicating with people. We declare uh, the Lord. Uh, we witness of the Lord. Um, the, the coals of fire is a manifestation of the, of, the, um, of the power of God. And in many, many ways, it's the turning on, so to speak. It's the over overriding the human humanity with the Holy Spirit. And so um, we still human vessels, but God enters us. And when the Holy Spirit enters us, it changes us. And there's a manifestation. We can see it. Uh, we, can, we can feel it. We can kind of hear it. And it's a fascinating yet common occurrence uh, for the Holy Spirit-filled Christian. The diverse gifts of the Spirit can be exercised uh, but the speaking with authority and clarity, I believe, is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit moving through his church. Um, I get thrilled when I'm with brothers or sisters that have fully surrendered to Christ and have experienced both baptisms, the baptism of repentance, and we'll talk about that a little later, or coming up here, and in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is the Holy Spirit, truly their fellowship is edifying and challenging and leads me closer to Christ. When we allow the Holy Spirit to work in us, it's edifying to the church. It's edifying to ourself, but it's, it's God's plan for the church to be empowered through the Holy Spirit. The Bible teaches not to quench the Holy Spirit. We need to exercise our gifts with self-control. Um, sometimes that's a stumbling block. Um, but Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, when, when Paul was instructing the, the Corinthian church who was very active in using the gifts of the Spirit, on that subject, Paul wrote very clearly 14, uh, 1 Corinthians 14, chapter, uh, chapter 14, verse 32, and the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. So it's very important that we, as a church, exercise self-control as we exercise our gifts in the notion that people go off in the name of the Holy Spirit in unbiblical and, and um, uh, in unprofitable ways is, is um, something that we have to deal with. It's, it's, not, it's not new, and, and yet it's not something to be, uh, we should not quench the Holy Spirit just because some people misuse it. We need to instruct and edify with um, humility. Okay, I mentioned um, the two baptisms. I think it's important here that we exercise thinking that Jesus said that John baptized with water, but I will baptize with the Holy Spirit in a fire. And so let's look at the two baptisms. Um, there are two baptisms, the baptism of repentance, which is of water, believing that Jesus is the Christ, and that's what John baptized, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And when Peter denied Christ 50 days earlier, he believed in Christ. 
but he had not yet been baptized with the Holy Spirit. So we can have a belief in Christ and still not have that power and, that, and not have maturity and not have um, all that we need to operate fully according to God's plan. The second baptism is superior to the first um, because it's given to us through, through Christ. That not only Holy Spirit comes upon the believer and gives power to be witnesses and boldness in the gifts of the Spirit are accompanied and receiving, accompanied with receiving the Holy Spirit. Okay, yeah. My re misread my notes just a little bit. The second baptism is a, is superior in that the that now the Holy Spirit comes upon the believers. Okay. And uh, Acts 19.4 brings an account of the two baptisms. Let's go to Acts 19 and 4. And this is a, um, very instructive in terms of this idea of the two baptisms and what's the significance of both of them. And Paul said, John baptized, okay, let me go back. I'll just read it. The beginning of the verse probably sounds, uh, the chapter's best. So I'm starting at uh, Acts 19, verse 1. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples, and he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. So the baptism of John is the, of the repentance. Like I said, we come to him in lowliness, and we come to him usually um, at a time when when we come to the end of ourselves and we believe in the one who has come to save us, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about 12 men in all. And so, when um, there were two baptisms that took place and Paul made a big distinction between the baptism of John and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so that is what we are experiencing on this first day, God's plan um, on Pentecost when the church was birthed to exercise um, or, or to manifest that second baptism, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he gave two um, manifestations, the wind and the cloves of fire. So I've got a question that comes up a lot. And are the gifts of the Spirit, are they for today or have they ceased? Um, I think it's appropriate for us to discuss that now because we're looking at the birth of the church. The church age is still in, in, in effect. The church age will, will stay in effect until the church is taken to Christ and then the Christ will come back with him and reign in the millennial kingdom. Um, and then we'll, after the millennial is done, then we'll live with uh, Christ and God forever and eternity. But this age, is marked by the church age. This is the, the age of the church. And this was the establishment of the church on the very first day that God established the church. He gave the Holy Spirit. And those gifts are a part of what the Holy Spirit does. And there's, uh, Paul goes into great detail in Corinthians uh, chapter 12 and 14. Um, but the important, I think, thing is 
what is our understanding and what is our assurance that these gifts should be exercised now or shouldn't be? Some believers, um, much like what we saw with Paul in, in Apollos, Apollos was not promoting the Holy Spirit. He was spe- uh, teaching the word and, and preaching repentance, but was not preaching the Holy Spirit. Paul didn't attack Apollos for, for that. He just showed a, a, a better way. He just showed more fulfillment. And so I want to just have us look at what the scripture says. And if we do come into a conversation with those that are, are not exercising uh, the gifts of the Spirit, we should encourage um, one another in what the scripture teaches. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, it says, we are all baptized into the body of Christ. We are all baptized into the body of Christ. For in one spirit, we all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slave or free, as all were made to drink of one spirit. So the baptism of the spirit is a unifying for all races all class of people. It is for the entire world into one body. Um, so we know that that's, that's a, it's a foundation that I wanted to lay out. But really the question comes, when, when will um, these gifts be un, unneeded? What's the time period? And there is a time period um, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8 and 9, lays out the time period very clearly. Um, remember, I said that the chapters 12 and 14 were about the, the, um, the gifts of the Spirit. But in the middle of that, Paul writes the famous love chapter in uh, 1 Corinthians 13. And he's talking about the the need for love, the importance, that, the, the, um, the supremacy of love. And we'll pick it up in uh, verse 8. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. The perfect, Strong's definition for perfect is completeness comes, when things are complete. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now we know in part, but then shall I know even as also, I am known. That's the, the time when the gifts of the spirits will be done away with. When we transform into a different time, when we see face to face, when we don't see darkly, when we know as we are known. The people that believe that the spirits that the gifts of the Spirit are past, believe that the canon of the Scripture, the writings, Paul's writings, Peter's writings, all the New Testament, when they were presented and canonized into Scripture, that that is the, all of the information that we needed. And at that point, the, before that time, this, the, the gifts were an authentication of their um, uh, authenticity of being Christian and that after the canon was provided we are complete we don't need anything more um, but yet so the canon of scripture we've had it um, since um, shortly well I'm not quite sure when it started but certainly um, for thousands a thousand years um, and here we're operating right now in the canon of scripture and quite frankly, do we see clearly? Are we known as we are known? So Samuel gives us an idea of, 
of how we are known. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. So I know when I look um, into a person, I see his actions, but I can't see your heart. I don't know your heart. I don't think you know my heart. Um, God knows my heart. In fact, that's one of the one of the struggles that I have with my children. I think it's a struggle we have in relationships is um, the people that are close to us get us, but sometimes our personalities are such that we we can't always express our, our hearts and our hearts are, our hearts desire are not always, and I think it's part of that sanctification process. I think we can do better at it, but I think it's part of the dynamic that we're living in a world where, where um, we still see darkly and um, we don't see face to face. We, we, we know in part, but we don't know completely. And so I think it's very clear in my understanding of Scripture that the, um, what Paul is talking about is our bodies when we are transformed, when God gives us our glorified bodies. And those bodies will have these um, attributes. Um, we'll have the body that Christ had. We'll, we'll have um, uh, an eternal body. And um, I believe that the gifts of the Spirit are for us until we are taken away in and through the rapture. And uh, that would be all I have to say on that. Um, and uh, it is not... Um, it is not without controversy, um, but I do think that uh, this church, for example, we believe very much in the, in the gifts of the Spirit, and there are other churches in town that, that do not, and they both function, and we both um, love the Lord, and um, there are, um, you could say those are the personalities of the church. Um, I, I, I would think that um, one of the things that God, reason God gave us the gifts of the Spirit is that we could have power um, to be bold and also to, um, that we could function fully um, and not be hindered. And so he's given us this on this day, and uh, I think it's important for us to try to exercise as the Scripture encourages us, don't quench the Holy Spirit, um, but... Um, uh, start using it in, in asking God to provide uh, you the gifts that, that you desire. And not all the gifts, we're not, uh, we're not going to have all the gifts, and I'm not going to get into the gifts tonight or today. Um, we'll have plenty of time to do that. But I do think it's important that this particular day, the Holy Spirit was given in a manifestation where people spoke in unknown tongues and uh, there were cloves of fire. So... I still have one other thought I want to go through um, before I go into the, uh, the actual speaking in tongues. But let's look at the purpose of the church. So the church was established on this day. So I think it's helpful for us to think about what's the purpose of the church. And um, I did some looking, and of course it's, it's not necessarily laid out. This is the purpose of the church in the Bible. But um, I went to uh, Greg Laurie's website, Harvest, and uh, actually I just Googled uh, the purpose of the church and came up with Greg Laurie's Harvest website, and I thought he did a nice job. He's got threefold purpose. Uh, the first purpose is to plunder Satan's kingdom. It's evangelism. The first purpose uh, if you remember, the first time the word church was appeared in the Bible was when uh, Jesus said it in Matthew 16, 18, after the transfiguration. And uh, Peter declared that you are the Christ. And he said, who do men say that I am? He said, you are the Christ. And when Jesus said, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Um, that's the first time the word church was used in the Bible. Uh, Jesus commissioned the church. He's empowered the church on the first day with the Holy Spirit. One of the purposes 
of the church is to plunder um, the kingdom of darkness, to save people, to declare Christ um, as the Savior and take people out of darkness and into light. That's a compelling purpose that the church has. It's a compelling purpose in our individual lives. It's how we've come to be where we're at. If, if we didn't have that, um, that transformation, the light coming on, someone sharing the gospel with us, uh, we wouldn't come to it on our own. Jesus also said when he called Peter, from now on you will be catching men. Uh, and he said that to both Peter and Andrew and, and um, uh, John and, and his brother, I can't think of his name. But anyway, the fishermen, he told them they were going to be catching men now, not catching fish. So that evangelism. So that's the heart of God. That's one of the purposes. Um, number two, the exaltation of God. Um, First Peter says it so eloquently uh, in chapter two, verse nine, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praise of him who has called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. While in times past you were not a people, but are now the people of God, which has not, which had not obtained mercy, but now has obtained mercy. So this transformation that God has done from taking us from darkness to light, from being um, children of wrath to children of, of, of God, adopted into the family, co-heirs with Christ, um, we need to be exalting and we need to have uh, a worshipful, worshipful heart and proclaiming um, to our friends that, that you know, uh, the unspeakable joy that we have because of what God has done. I think the longer I, I live and walk in the Lord, the more that strikes me is just how marvelous um, what God has taken me from and into. I think what, what I've taken from is not I think the longer that I've walked, I've learned that my ways were darker than they appeared at the time. I think as we walk in the Lord, uh, there's a more recollection of our sins being more grievous than we, than we want to uh, uh, think of them at the time. But what has made me aware of that is not thinking how bad I was, but how wonderful God is and how gracious he is and how kind and in the things that he has for us for eternity. And I think the more we behold, as um, Peter is saying here, this marvelous light, um, which at times we were not a people, but now we are. We didn't have mercy, but now we have. Uh, we are um, a peculiar people in that um, we are, um, we are the children of God. And if you're not a child of God, you really don't understand that, and that's something that we get to to explain and at least uh, be joyful of and exalt God in that. Um, uh, another one, in terms of the exaltation of God, we can do it in everything that we do. I brought to mind the um, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So what, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. And so that is the purpose of the church is to bring glory to God, um, our good works that they would bring glory to the Father. And the third um, purpose of the church is the edification of the saints. Paul said his goal was not merely to evangelize, but to present every person uh, perfect in Christ. And that's a paraphrase of Colossians 1:28.
So Ephesians 4 talks about the um, 11 through 15. I'm going to read this. Um, it talks a little bit about the purpose of edification and how God uses the Holy Spirit to edify the church. He himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, which is incredible. God is, per is perfecting us into the image of Christ. Um, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plottery, of plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head. And that's Christ. So that's the edification process, and God uses the gifts. He uses teachers and prophets and um, apostles and in uh, the purpose of of those um, of is to equip and edify um, the body to grow into into Christ. So that's the purpose of the church. The church is to evangelize, to exalt Christ, and to um, uh, in, uh, equip for maturity to help mature the body into the image of Christ. Okay, so now I'd like to um, take a little look at this idea of where everybody came from. So verse 6 through 13, let's move on now that we've done a good job of, I think, um, looking at Five more minutes. Good job of looking at what uh, the um, the activities were. Let's take a look at what the um, reaction was from the crowd. So verse verse six, and at this sound the multitude came together. And they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and the visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and uh, Arabians, we hear them telling us in our own tongues the mighty works of God. So this geography lessons um, was a little interesting. A lot of these uh, locations are, are um, we, can, we have them today, Egypt, Libya, um, Cyrene, that's in um, northern Africa. Um, Judea. Um, some of them not. Pontus was in uh, Italy. Um, Parthian, it was at, that was in Greece. Greece. We've got Medes, which was a part of the Persian Empire. Medes and Persians. I shouldn't say Medes was not part of the Persian Empire, but it's a part of Iran. Uh, Mesopotamia is Iraq. So in today's um, geography, you had people, and these were devout Jews that were coming from these other countries for the pe that were living in, in uh, Jerusalem from Greece, from Rome, from Egypt, from Turkey, from Iran, from uh, Libya, from Saudi Arabia, from Egypt, from Iraq. Um, pretty much all around the region, upwards hundreds and hundreds of miles away. And in all of those, 
nations had different languages. So here they were hearing this noise and they come in and just imagine having a room and you got these Galileans, you got these local yokels and they're speaking French and they're speaking um, Japanese and they're speaking, um, you know, all the different languages that we have right here of people that, that, uh, that live here, uh, Croatian, um, all the different, um, obviously uh, Spanish, that's, that's fairly common, but all of the different languages, it was mind-blowing. It was, and the open hearts were saying, boy, what's going on? And the mockers would say, oh, they're just full of wine. Um, and Peter's going to say something about that. But, um, but this is the blueprint that God had laid out for the church. Um, it's controversial. And isn't that just like, um, and it's controversial because there's an opposer. It's not controversial because it's, it's controversial in and of itself. It's controversial because we have uh, an opposer. We have, we have Satan, and he doesn't want our kingdom to flourish, and our kingdom is a threat to him. Jesus laid it out at the beginning. What was the purpose of the church? To plunder Satan's kingdom. And so um, Satan sees this as a threat, and we're learning that very directly in Nehemiah. And um, as we exercise our gifts, as we stand up and grow, Expect opposition, but understand that he is with you is much more powerful than he is in the world. And I think that's the other thing that we, um, as we live and walk in the spirit, um, we don't have to understand. We just have to trust in God. And I, I think of when Jesus gave instructions, don't think about what you're going to say when you get taken to the courts. I'll give you the words to say. And that's the beauty of living in the Holy Spirit is we have the words at the time we need them. And um, we can live in that freedom, in that joy, and uh, uh, assurance that God is with us. And, um, and I think that there's a certain amount of, of um, how do I say, it's kind of nice to be able to walk in the unexpected. If we're, you know, some of our lives are so controlling and we want to have everything because we're fearful. But this Christian life isn't that way. The Christian life is trusting. And the Christian life is, in, is um, watching the Lord work in us. And, and, and I think we've all experienced this when the Holy Spirit comes in and starts um, taking over. We say things that we don't even realize that we had in our hearts. But the Holy Spirit um, will will intervene and it's very glorious and it's very exciting to understand that we're just a vessel in the Holy Spirit, something more powerful and the love of God uh, can come and work in us. And I think uh, that would be what I'd, I'd, I'd wanna just emphasize today is that as a church, God has a glorious beginning and he has a glorious future for us. And um, let's, uh, let's not shy from, from those things that, um, that God has put in us. Let's not be afraid. Let's not um, quench. Let's have open hearts and have faith. So thank you, Lord, for your, your word today. Thank you, Lord, for just loving us so much and bringing us the gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, thank you for your plan that you have um, uh, you knew the day that you were going to present it. You know the day that you're going to present us to your 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 son as as the um, as the bride of Christ. Um, these are all in the fullness of time. We do not know that. That's not an, of our understandings. But Lord, as we as we see and we look back, we can be assured that nothing comes by chance. There's nothing that you haven't already planned out ahead of us, and um, we can rest in your love for us and that you want to use this in powerful and mighty ways. In Jesus' name, amen.